um, are uh, put together to form your polynucleotide. Uh, now, the nitrogenous bases and the sugars change um, and can change. And so there are two types of nitrogenous bases, permitings and purines, whether or not they have a single ring or a double ring fused together. And then DNA is the sugar, it has the sugar deoxyribose, and RNA has the sugar ribose. So this picture here shows you, the top picture shows you the different nitrogenous bases. So in terms of structure, the nitrogenous bases are in a ring, but they contain <laughs> nitrogen. That's what's different between them and like a monosaccharide. Monosaccharides like glucose is also in a ring, but does glucose contain nitrogen? No, okay? And so, so here are your nitrogenous bases. And so there's cytosine, thymine, uracil, adenine, and guanine. And notice that we can shorthand them by C, T, U, A, and G. Do you remember these letters from DNA from bio? All right, so, so <coughs> when we look at this, notice that these three have one ring, these two have two rings, and they're fused together, meaning that they share a side. So these guys are permitines, these are purines. Um, for the test, what you don't need to know is I won't ask you um, what a pyrimidine is and be able to identify a pyrimidine or a purine. So I'm not going to ask you those classifications. And I won't ask you, like, out of these molecules, which one's cytosine, all right? I, I don't expect you to know that either. What I do expect you to know is if I look, that you should be, you could look at this and tell me that it's a nitrogenous base. It's rings and um, contains nitrogen. Okay, so that's my expectation, all right? So then when we look at this, notice that cytosine, adenine, and guanine don't have anything written after it, but these two do. Thymine has says in DNA, and uracil says, uracil says in RNA. So that means that thymine, this particular base is only found in DNA, and this particular base is only found in RNA. So when you're making um, uh, nucleotides, each type of nucleic acid, DNA and RNA, both have four types of nucleotides. So the nucleotide has the phosphate, it has the sugar, and if, it's, if this is DNA, the sugar is gonna be deoxyribose. And then you have your base here, and the base can be one of four different bases. It could be an A, T, C, or G for DNA. And so no use in, in um, DNA. So when you're, when you're making DNA and therefore a polynucleotide to make DNA, here's the bond between that nucleotide and the next nucleotide. So then we have the phosphate and your sugar, deoxyribose, and then you have your base. So in this particular, uh, this base could be an A, and that nucleotide makes that nucleotide different than this base could be a C. All right, and so then when we build our polynucleotides, there's always gonna be this, what we call the backbone, this phosphate sugar backbone that just alternates phosphates and sugars as part of the nucleic acids that are hooked together. And it's the A's, T's, C's, and G's, the order of these that can vary depending upon how you put the, the nucleotides together. So, so in making DNA, there's four different choices. You have a nucleotide with an A, nucleotide with a T, nucleotide with a C, nucleotide with a G, and then you hook them together. And it's these order of these nucleotides that um, give you information. This is the info to make a protein, so, so or a polypeptide. So we talked yesterday about um, DNA being made out of genes, and genes contain instructions to make polypeptides. It's really the order of these A's, T's, C's, and G's that is the instructions that that governs the making of that. And so that's DNA, so then RNA, RNA has the phosphate, and it has a pentose sugar, but it's ribose, and then your base could be here, A, U, C, G, so, the, so no T, but having a U. And so there are four <laughs> bases to choose from, uh, it's four nucleotides, so there are some nucleotides that have an A in the space spot, some with a U, some with a C, and some with a G. And so then we hook those together as well to make your right, chain. So this could be a U, all right, and so on and so forth. So that's the base part. And then the sugar, as I just said, is um, dif uh, differs. DNA has deoxyribose, RNA has ribose. Uh, if we look at the structure, 
There's only one difference. You see right here and right here, ribose has an OH here, a hydroxyl group, and deoxyribose does not. So this missing oxygen is the only difference between the two. So that's why it's called deoxyribose, because it's really oxy, uh, 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 ribose missing an oxygen. Deoxy means taking off the oxygen. So it's missing an oxygen. And so that's why it's called deoxyribose. So DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose, and RNA, the sugar is ribose. And so those are some of the difference between the two classes of nucleic acids. All right, so let's look at building the polymer. So the nucleotide polymers are linked together, building a polynucleotide, so that's what I started doing here. Adjacent nucleotides are joined by covalent bonds that form between the hydroxyl group on the three prime carbon of one of the nucleotides and the phosphate on the five prime carbon. These links create a backbone of sugar phosphate units with nitrogenous bases as appendages. And the sequence of bases along a DNA or mRNA polymer is unique for each gene. So that's what I was getting at here. The order of these bases can change, and it's the order of those bases that makes a gene unique from other genes in your DNA, and therefore code for different polypeptides. What this means by it creates a backbone of phosphate sugar units so if we look at this, what I just drew here, they call this part right here the backbone. The backbone just has the alternating phosphate sugars of the adjoining nucleotide. What's sticking out of that backbone and varies from nucleotide to nucleotide is the basis. So that's what it means by appendages <coughs> sticking out of there. So as you hopefully remember that DNA, the structure is in the form of a double helix. So a DNA molecule actually has two polynucleotides spiraling around an imaginary axis forming a double helix. In the DNA double helix, the two backbones run in opposite five to three prime directions from one another, and this is called anti-parallel. One DNA molecule includes many genes we talked about yesterday. And the nitrogenous bases in DNA form hydrogen bonds in a complementary fashion. A always goes with T and G always goes with C. Which is what this picture is showing you. So here we have at the top, this is the double helix. Double coming from there's just two strands of nucleotides. Helix is the coiling. Did I go too fast? Did I have to go back? Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome, people. polynucleotide strand here, one here, and they are held together by these dot, dot, dots called hydrogen bonds, all right? So, so when we look at this, this ribbon part here, what that really is, that's the backbone. So that represents the alternating phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, and what's sticking out, you can see here are the bases. So the G, G, T, G, A, and so on. And then the other strand, that hydrogen bonds to this strand, uh, has the opposite bases in our base pairing rule. So C always goes with G, um, and A always goes with T. So whenever you see a T, there's an opposite A on the other side. And so, so um, that's the, the double helix. So let me ask you this. If we were to take the double helix and untwist it and break the hydrogen bond so that you only had one half of the DNA molecule, could you tell what the other half would be from that one half? Absolutely, so if there's a, a nucleotide with a T, you know that you would need a nucleotide with an A, all right? And you could build the other side. And so that's, um, because of that, um, DNA can replicate itself very easily because of those base pairing rules. And so what happens in our cells, 
when DNA replicates is the DNA literally comes apart so that we untwist and the hydrogen bonds are broken. And then with the exposed bases, we can add new nucleotides. So there's a C, a nucleotide with a G gets added. C with a G, A becomes a T, and so on and so forth. And you do that to the other side, and what you end up is two strands exactly like the first. In what situation would a cell want to replicate its DNA like this? Why would it do that? That's right, when it's, the cell is dividing through mitosis. So when it divides, the cell literally splits in half and each new cell has to have the appropriate amount of DNA. So if you didn't replicate your DNA and it divided in half, each cell would have half the amount of DNA it's supposed to. So they replicate and so each cell gets the appropriate amount of DNA. And the, the DNA's construction, the, the structure helps with that by having these base pairing rules. And so <coughs> we use DNA and proteins to compare organisms. So the linear sequences of nucleotides and DNA molecules are passed from parents to offspring. Two closely related species are more similar in DNA than are more distantly related species. Molecular bi biology can be used to assess evolutionary kinship or relationships or relatedness is what that means. So basically, <coughs> Molecular biology is studying the molecules of biology. The two main molecules that we study is DNA and protein. So when we study DNA, what we're looking at is the order of these bases. Because the order of the bases in our genes, um, like between you and I, our genes and the order of our bases are very similar. We're part of the same species. Um, they're not exact because we're not all identical twins. All right, but we have a lot in common. And so that's what we look at is the order, of, the order of the bases in DNA, not the phosphates and the sugars. That's the same between every living thing. It's the order of the bases that can change. And so then we can compare um, two organisms that are different um, species and say, okay, 80% of the DNA is the same. What does that mean when we say 80% of the DNA between two species are the same? We're looking at the order of these bases and seeing if they're, they're the same or not, all right? And so therefore, the more common our DNA is, the more related and closely related we are, all right? And so that's that. And we'll uh, hit on that point later on in the course, all right? And that's the end. Okay, so what I wanna do next is I wanna just quickly go over the rest of the answers of that cutout packet. We didn't do carbohydrates and nucleic acids, and I want to just make sure you have the right answers for those. Carbon in it, so that's all of these things here. All right, 
So then the next question on the previous page asked you what atoms are the, the, they made out of, and you should have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Then it asked you, another page, how many monosaccharides are there? You should have two, and disaccharides, you should have two. <clears throat> so let's look at the mono and disaccharide. These two are your two monosaccharides. How do I know that they're monosaccharides? Um, they're, they're rings and they only have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. These two are disaccharides, two rings hooked together, two rings hooked together, and <coughs> made out of just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. All right, so all of these right here would be under the category of carbohydrates um, as a result of that. That number, or the top of this page, talked about table sugar. So you had to look up sucrose and it asks you which two monosaccharides combine to form sucrose, and it's glucose and fructose. Then it asks you to draw glucose and fructose, and so I went ahead and drew them together, uh, or drew them, and then which atoms are removed during the bonding of the two um, monosaccharides? You, you lose um, an OH and an H, so OH off of one and H off of another, and then you therefore lose a water molecule and then you form a glycosidic linkage between those. All right, and so no H comes off of one, H comes off of another. And that is your carbohydrates. Any questions on that? All right, nucleic acid, then next. So in the center of the page, it tells you, this is the monomer of a nucleic acid, um, a nucleotide. It has a base, hydrogenous base, the sugar, and a phosphate group. So down here, it says paste your nitrogenous bases from part one below. And you should have five different nitrogenous bases. How do I know they're nitrogenous bases? I'm looking for their rings, and they contain nitrogen. So that's, there's only two kinds of rings we've looked at. Sugar molecules like glucose, and nitrogenous bases, all right? The sugars and the um, carbohydrates and the bases. So how do I tell the difference between them, the bases and nitrogen, the third part of them, all right? And so it makes sense that there's five based upon what we just talked about. The five bases are A, T, C, G, and U, all right? So those are the five. You, like I said, um, you, I wouldn't expect you to know which ones are which, but that these are just nitrogenous bases. So then let me ask you this, if I were to cover up the phosphate part and the nucleotide, and we're just looking at just the base and the sugar, that's not called a nucleotide, it's called a nucleoside. And that's what the next question asked you, it was you had to figure out which ones were nucleosides that just have the base and the sugar. And so, so that's these guys here, there should be four of them. So they have the nitrogenous base on the top connected to your pentose sugar on the bottom. And so there's four of them. Um, let me ask you this, would these make up, um, would these be used to make DNA or RNA? These are right here. And how can you tell? Sugar that we, the sugar, um, remember if we look up here, ribose has this OH, deoxyribose just has an H here, and so these guys have the OH, so these guys, the sugar is ribose, which means that they comprise RNA, alright, as a result of that. Okay, and then the last one asks you to paste. The, it says and label the nucleoside mono di and triphosphate. Let me explain that here. These three here. I just want to look at this one right here. This is what um, this is the structure that we just talked about in the notes of the nucleotide: the base, the sugar, and the phosphate group. And that's what you need to know for Monday: that, that a nucleotide is made out of a nitrogenous base, either the sugar deoxyribose and ribose, or the phosphate group. Um, and so that's that's a monophosphate because there's only one phosphate. We'll learn later on in the course that really when we make DNA, 
And really, the, it comes in the form at first of a triphosphate, but for um, Monday's test, you don't need to know that. So this would be the triphosphate, um, the three phosphate groups with the sugar and the base, and the dye with two phosphates, the sugar and the base. And so then I asked you, the last question I asked you, which um, of these elements are contained in nucleic acids? And so the sugar has the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The nitrogenous base adds the nitrogen, and the phosphate groups adds the phosphorus. All right, so we have all of those. And then I just wanted to point out here the summary. The summary just gives you, there's nothing to do with that on there. Um, I know a lot of people ask, you know, um, do I have to do, do I have to do something in the summary? Do I have to fill in this table? Because when we look at the table, and it goes to the next page here, there's a lot of blanks and so on. So some people thought, am I supposed to be filling stuff out here? And let's look at the, how the table is constructed. When we look at the front, it says the class is proteins. The next um, column says building blocks. Um, there's only one building block of protein, and that's amino acids. So we only need one line to fill what the building block is. But then the next one says, what kind of macromolecules, what kinds of examples of proteins do we have? Enzymes, hormones, all right, and so on and so forth. So there's multiple lines for this uh, in terms of the types of um, proteins that you can have. And that's why there's multiple lines in this row. So there's, there's nothing needed to be filled in here. It's just that it has extra lines in that column because there needed to be extra lines in this column. So I just wanted to point that out to people. So this just gives you an overview of information about all of them. All right? How'd you guys do on that? the AP test is, is, is the format as part multiple choice. And so what will happen is when you come in to take the test, I'll give you the multiple choice packet with a Scantron sheet first. I make enough copies for the test that you can write on it if that helps you. All right, so you can draw on it, cross things out, whatever, if that helps you. And um, so then you'll do the multiple choice part and finish that. You'll come up here. You'll put your multiple choice booklet and your Scantron up here, and then I'll have an, uh, uh, the written part for you to pick up. So the written part is separate, you know, than the multiple choice, and you pick that up after you finish the multiple choice. Then you do the written part, and then you come up and turn the written part, and you'll be done. All right. So that's how that works, and um, <coughs> that's the format. Um, bring. I want you to get used to. I talked about. Um, I talked about. Um, <coughs> writing in pen for the AP test. So I'd like you to get used to that. So I'd like you to bring a black pen, all right, to, to write in. So bring a black pen. And um, remember that for any tests, uh, you, can, you can use a calculator, but if you haven't already done so, you need to get the four function calculator with a square root, all right, um, uh, on it. Is that the door? Yeah. Oh, is it locked? Yes. Oh, I didn't know it was locked. All right, question. We shouldn't need a calculator for the test, right? You shouldn't need a calculator, no, you shouldn't. Um, uh, I do have a molarity problem. All right, heads up on that. All right, all right. So that's something you can do without a calculator, though. All right, but. If you want to save yourself a few seconds on the test, you just, you know. All right. Um, is there any part of like an essay or is it like short answers? Um, this one I put a few short answers. Okay. All right. On there. Okay. So that's the format of the test. And, um, and so obviously there's a lot of material. I will tell you the bulk of the test is 
chapters three, four, and five. I just put a couple questions about um, from one and two, just a couple of them. All right, so the majority is three, four, and five. So um, most of your studying should be within that. Okay, and um, obviously that uh, I can't ask a question on every single thing that we've gone over. Um, otherwise, the test will be like three hours long. Okay, so so therefore I have to pick and choose um, with that. But the thing is, is that you have to study it all because you don't know what I'm going to be picking and choosing. Um, and so so um, so just keep be aware of that. Uh, some of the questions I will. Um, I have a couple of different levels of thinking in like so for example I might ask I might have some pictures kind of like the organic pictures you cut out and so so I might have like six pictures there and the question might be pick out the molecule that is the major component of a cell membrane so your thought process then has to be a couple steps you have to say what in the world is found in a cell membrane, what's the major component in a cell membrane, and then on top of that, what does it look like, and pick it out, okay? So so that's testing quite a, 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 a couple of different things, um, the function as well as the structure in one question. What would be the answer to that? What would be the answer to that question? That's a phospholipid. Phospholipids, remember, have the head portion. It has the glycerol and two fatty acids. And it has a phosphate group instead of a third fatty acid. All right? And so, so that's um, what the answer there would be. All right? So, so I just wanted to give you an example of something so you're, you're not, you know, surprised or anything like that. Okay? Um, so that's the format of the test. Um, uh, in terms of studying, I just want to talk a little bit about um, studying. Hopefully, you've studied before today, all right? Um, and so you should be studying as we go along, all right? And studying um, a couple of things about that. Like yesterday, I put that chart about carbohydrates and so on. And so in studying, uh, you know, you can read your notes, you can read the book, um, then that helps to to digest the information. But the thing is, is that sometimes it can make sense when you're reading it in the textbook or reading it in your notes. And um, and I'd like you to kind of get in the habit of trying to explain it on your own. So you could do something like take a piece of paper, like I did with with carbohydrates and like with lipids. Can I sit down and say, okay, what are lipids? What are the different categories of lipids? Can I not only name them? So then can I name them and then can I draw them out? Can I tell you what um, components they're made out of? So can, I, can you say that phospholipids is one category of a lipid and it's made out of a glycerol attached with two fatty acids and a phosphate group? And then where am I gonna find a phospholipid, all right? And what are the properties? Do I know that the tails are hydrophobic and the head is hydrophilic and goes towards the water? So, so see if you can do that off the top of your head versus just reading about it because like I said, you can get a false sense of understanding and what you know if you read about it and it makes sense, but it's, it's another whole thing to kind of come up with it on your own. And when you do stuff like that, I would suggest like if you're studying, like reading your notes and things like that, separate the the trying to write out or explain it on your own from the reading. Because sometimes if you read right away and try to explain right away, it, you can do it because you just read it and it's fresh in your mind. So if you give some space between it and then try without looking at it, okay, I'm going to sit down and have a conversation about proteins, all right? Can I talk about the four levels of structure of proteins and what holds them together and what they are? Um, and if you can't, then you go back and fill it in and so on, and then you're more apt to remember it, and then maybe five hours later, try it again, or something the next day, try it again. Um, and so those are some hints there um, for you. I also uploaded a couple more um, practice documents on my website. I didn't make copies or anything like that, but. Um, you know, I, I put some documents, they have practice things with like pictures of molecules and identifying them and, um, and what's a carbohydrate and, and all that kind of stuff. And I put answer keys on there too, so that you can know what the right answers are. And so you can do that to kind of assess yourself as well. So those are some things that I would suggest doing. 
All right. Okay. And then, um, then you know, I've been videotaping as well. So if you're like, oh my gosh, I really don't get proteins. Maybe you can look at the day that we did proteins again and look at that video if you if you'd like. Um, also, at the beginning of the year, I talked about that. Um, man named Paul Anderson, he does the Bozeman, out of Bozeman, Montana. Um, you can Google him, um, if you write Bozeman Science, his website will come up. He is a bio, AP Biology student section. You can see, does he have a video on carbohydrates? Anything that you can get your hands on, sometimes it's helpful to hear somebody else explain it besides your teacher sometimes. That's helpful too, so, you know, different people explain things a little bit differently. And so um, anything that you can do like that could be helpful. All right, so those are my helpful little hints for you, or hopefully are helpful hints, all right? So, so with that being said, um, does anybody have any questions about content? Like, do you have things that you just are like, oh, just go over this one more time or anything that comes to mind. And while you're looking, I just want to spend a minute and talk about, you know, I asked if there's any questions. Um, just in the future for this class, this is supposed to be a college level class. In college, when you take a college course and you have questions, you have to really seek out help. You know, you have to go to your professor's office hours and, you know, trudge across through the snow across campus to their office to ask questions and things like that. Um, and so, so for like today, you know, the day before the test, um, what I'd like you to try and get in the habit of doing, and I talked about doing this on a regular basis, even in class, but I'd like you to have to have studied before the day before the test and come to class with questions about what you don't understand. Um, and so I can help you, uh, you, you can help me help you do better by asking questions about what you don't understand. I certainly can't teach everything agree, again the day before the test to help you to review and, and things like that. But if you narrow some things down for me or some confusing points, I can help you with those the day before. Um, I think all too often, um, you know, in school, in the school setting, um, we often rely on the teacher to run a review, like they expect the teacher just to go over, what do I need to know? And you have a more passive role in the process. You should have a more active role. Really, the review should be the students, and the teacher should be kind of the, just the helpful thing, you know, person behind it. So in the in the future, I'd like you to try and say, okay, what are my questions? And I, when I was studying, I found that I didn't understand this, 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 all right, these four things or whatever it may be, and come to class and you can ask those four things because I promise you, if you have those questions, other people have those questions. Um, but um, uh, I'd like you to be a little bit more pro, a little proactive with that. All right, it's helpful for the teacher to know. All right, what what kinds of things you have trouble with? Okay. So anybody come up with anything? Okay. So with the chaperonins, is that what you're talking about? Okay. So protein folding. Uh, remember, at the end you have the either the tertiary or the quaternary structure of your protein where it folds and the R groups can interact with one another and you start to get your three-dimensional shape. Um, but that protein folding actually occurs in another molecule called the chaperonin. I'm not a very good drawer here. And it has a cap, the cap comes off. And so when you have your polypeptide chain that's so this is your primary structure, your chain of amino acids. This enters into this chaperone, which has a like a hollow space, a hollow cylinder inside of it. And so this polypeptide comes in and the cap comes on. And then the chaperone changes shape. And when it changes shape, it kind of alters where the, the polypeptide and the R groups, here's the R groups hanging off, all right, R groups hanging off here. And so when it changes shape, it puts the polypeptide and arranges it in such a way that the R groups um, can bond with one another and therefore get its three-dimensional shape. So the chaperone changes shape, changes shape. Triangle means change. 
All right, so the shape, shape change here. And so, I don't know, let's do it like this here to show a shape change. Uh, it's not really like an hourglass, but I'm not a very good artist here. So and the shape change causes the curvature with the R groups to be able to bond and um, cause the three-dimensional shape. And then once it is, um, once it is folded, then it comes out, all right? So then it has this three-dimensional shape. So this is just a kind of a helper to cause the R groups that need to come into contact with each other to come into contact with each other. So is that from secondary to tertiary or? Secondary and tertiary, yep. Okay. So both of them, yep. So it could be from secondary to tertiary or tertiary to quaternary? Um, usually it's just, um, uh, it's just one polypeptide at a time, so it's just a tertiary. Then this would come into contact with another polypeptide would be doing the same thing in another one, and then they come together to form the quaternary. Um, yes, uh, um, but most of them do use the, sh the chaperone. Right. Um, well, but they, the the question was, do prokaryotic cells um, have chaperones? And, um, yes, because it's still it's just a prokaryote. It's not an organelle or anything like that. Any other question? What is height in? What is what? It's spelled height in <laughs> C H I T I N. That is your um, your. Uh, it's a polysaccharide, and um, that's the uh, chitin is the polysaccharide that is found in the exoskeletons of insects um, is found in the cell walls of fungus. So when we did the carbohydrates and we talked about polysaccharides and we categorized them as storage and structural, um, chitin is one of the two structural ones we looked at. Okay. okay. The second one was cellulose. I think you said something about proteins that could lose their shape and then you could change it back as well. Um, how was that? I knew that it could get denatured by um, like salt and pH, but I think you said there was a way to reverse it and then you could change yeah, it. Yeah, it's renaturation. Yes. So if the it's called renaturation. And so if the conditions go back to normal, it allows the R groups and so on to rebond. All right. said we just need to commit um, certain things to memory. Is what section were you talking about? I forgot. Did you mean the general? The functional groups? Did you mean the general ones or uh, was it more specific? I guess the word apply to both. Like there's a lot of memorization. Yeah. <laughs> a lot yeah. of memorization. So, yeah. so like <clears throat> I said that about the functional groups like the okay. Carbonyl with the C with the double bond to an O. Yes. <coughs> Hydroxyl is OH, and, mm -hmm. and so I just said that those you just have to sit and memorize, yeah. so that because then when we built on that with the carbohydrates, yeah. the lipids, and so on, those are embedded in there, and those are part of the uh, ways that you the, look at. It's the six functional groups. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Questions. <laughs> All right, so um, we're gonna, I'm gonna do what I said. I said I would start the next um, chapter, so we're gonna do that, um, and we'll continue on it on Tuesday after the test on Monday. Um, just to give you the big picture of where we're headed, so we just talked about molecules that are important for life. So um, we talked in chapter three about water, then we talked about organic molecules, and then chapter five were specific organic molecules, carbohydrates, lipids, um, proteins and nucleic acids. And so the next chapter, we have these organic molecules. These organic molecules come together to form larger structures, and those structures are gonna be the cell and the parts of the cell. So that's what um, chapter six is all about, is how we study cells, 
what types of cells are there and what do the parts of the cells do all right and so and then we'll look at chapter seven which is all about one cell type part which is the cell membrane so um so we'll look at the cell membrane how things go into and out of the cell and with that chapter with the cell membrane is when we get our first, do our first really big lab all right with that so all right so that gives you an idea of where we're going with that okay so from one another but share common features so that means that there are certain things that every single cell on earth have in common but then because cells are different because they do different functions and so on they have some different characteristics so when we look through the chapter we'll look at what does all cells have in common and look at some specific types of cells all right so what do we do use to study cells um, we study cells through the use of microscopes because cells cannot be seen by the naked eye. And so this picture here shows you um, what kind of types of things that can be seen with what types of microscopes. So we go from um, large to small here. And this shows you some things that can be seen with the unaided eye and things that you can see with the light microscope. Light microscopes are the types of microscopes we see and use here in school. And so you can see that you can see plant and animal cells um, pretty well underneath the light microscope. And you can also see um, the nucleus. Uh, you can see the nucleus, but it's hard to see some of the other organelles with our light microscope. The nucleus comes out clear, but other things are hard to see. And you see the bacteria. So, so when looking underneath the light microscope, if this is an animal cell, you can see the animal cell and you can see the nucleus really well, but other things it's hard to see. And then, it, so that's the animal cell. We can also <laughs> see bacteria, but bacteria in comparing in size, bacteria are, are way smaller. So bacteria underneath the microscope might look like this. They just look like little dots or little lines. Bacteria can either be spherical or rod-shaped, um, or, or they can coil. So these would be like rod-shaped bacteria. They're very, very small compared to an animal cell. So you can see them with a light microscope, but you can't see them very well. You can't see inside of them uh, and so on, but you definitely can see them. All right, um, you can, in, um, depending on the cell, you can see sometimes the mitochondria, um, but not very often, um, uh, uh, but you can sometimes see it. So, so anyway, so that's the light microscope. So to really study cells and to understand the structure, we often use electron microscopes. We don't have electron microscopes here at um, our school, but electron microscopes allow you to see really small, um, small things inside of the cell. And so when we look at, I just want to point here, these bottom two pictures here with the electron microscope, there's two different kinds. There's what's called a scanning and one's called a transmission. They're called electro, electron microscopes because they beam electrons at the sample. So, um, so the scanning scans the surface of whatever you're looking at. So this is the cilia, the, which are little hair-like structures on the outside of cells. And you can see it's almost a three-dimensional view of what the outside of the cell looks like. That's what scanning does, it scans the surface. Transmission, the electrons beam right through and you, or you can see the inside. 
So you'll start to see the inside of the cell and the inside of an organelle and so on. Um, so they give you, uh, both of them using electrons, but just a little bit different view of the cell. And so a lot of the pictures we'll look at um, as we go through here, there'll be one of uh, those types of electron microscope pictures. The thing with electron microscopes is that um, the sample, it kills them. So, so with a light microscope, you may have, in, in regular bio, did you ever look at pond water and unicellular organisms? Some of you have, some of you haven't. Um, and so obviously you can see living organisms, you can see them moving, the light microscope doesn't kill them, Trans the electron microscopes to look at them, beaming the electrons kills them so the organism has to be dead. So um, that's a little bit different um, as well between the two. All right, so in studying cells and cell parts, the cells, um, uh, we do what's called cell fractionation, which is um, separating out, taking the cell and separating out um, the different organelles. So you isolate organelles so that you can study them and see what they do. And so, <laughs> I need to get a new battery on this, I think. So the definition of that is um, you take cells apart and it separates the major organelles from one another. And we use a tool called a centrifuge to fractionate cells into their component parts. <clears throat> Cell fractionation enables scientists to determine the functions of organelles. So they separate the organelles and then can study them and look at their structure, look at their function, and so on. So, Biochemistry and cytology help correlate cell function with structure. So biochemistry is what we've been doing, all the chemistry, the carbs, lipids, proteins, and so on. And then cytology is the study of cells, cyto means referring to cells. So we link those together and we can um, study the, the function and structure of the cell. So this picture here shows you um, this fractionation process. So I'm gonna look at this, the top part first. So what you start out with is, this is a test tube and you can see all these cells. So these are cells, all the, the organelles are inside the cell. So there you have the cell membrane and you have all the organelles inside the cell. So then what they do is this homogenation, this is like a little mini blender is really what it is. All right, so there's blades in it. You spin it around, the blades are chopping up the cells. So the cells and all the parts the membranes are broken up, all the organelles, the mitochondria, the nucleus and stuff are all floating around, not contained in individual cells anymore. This is called the homogenate. So this is all the cell parts and the cell pieces. And so then what they do is take this homogenate and they um, screw it onto on the end here. And you can you do that, you can do two test tubes at once. So you screw another one on the end here. The centrifuge spins it around really fast. All right, this spinning around really fast, what it does is separates things based upon density. So the most dense things go to the bottom. And so that's what the next picture here shows you. So after 10 minutes of this spinning around, they stop it, and you get this pellet here at the bottom. All the most dense things go to the bottom. Everything that's less dense is floating around in the top, called the supernate. So this pellet here, the most dense things are gonna be all the nuclei. And so then you have this pellet with all the nuclei, and so then you can take it, separate the supernate, now take this pellet, and now you have a bunch of nuclei, the nucleus of the cells, that you can study and work with and so on. Take that supernate and spin it some more, all right? And we get the next dense uh, material. So you get mitochondria or chloroplasts if it's a plant cell. Uh, and so on, and so then you can study those. Take that pellet out, spin it again, the liquid again, and you get the next depth. So this is microsomes. Microsomes are um, fragments of the cell membrane, all right, so it's fragments of membranes there. And then you do it again and you get the, the smallest and also less dense, which, uh, which is your ribosomes. And then you can study the ribosomes and so on. So that's kind of a, uh, a method in studying and figuring out the structure of the organelles as well as the studying and trying to figure out the function. All right. So, <coughs> so that's how we study cells. Now we have different kinds of cells. Let's look at the 
title of this. It says eukaryotic cells have internal membranes that compartmentalize their functions. What in the world does that mean? Have internal membranes that compartmentalize their functions. Internal membranes. First, let's take that internal membrane. What does that mean? Um, there's a sort of cell wall on the inside of the um, cell that kind of like closes off certain areas of the cell that perform a certain function. So it's kind of like divided up in certain sections. That's exactly right. But there are cell membranes. So there are, cell, there are membranes inside the cell that, and they're internal meaning that they're inside the cell and they compartmentalize. So therefore, um, like uh, they compartmentalize and have, you have these different sections um, surrounded by membranes inside the cell. These different compartments, what do we call them inside of a cell? These are your organelles, all right? So these are your organelles. So this makes the cell pretty efficient because like for instance, a plant cell does photosynthesis. So all the stuff that's needed for photosynthesis, all the enzymes and so on and so forth are contained in the chloroplast. They're not just randomly floating around with everything else, they're contained in the chloroplast. And so therefore, everything you need for photosynthesis is in the chloroplast. Everything that you need for cellular respiration is in the mitochondria. And so you have these different compartments that help them to be more efficient to form, to do the job that they're supposed to do. All right, and this is where we need All right.